Hi, welcome to This Is My Architecture. My name is Andrea and I'm here with David from Toyota Research Institute and Arthur from Flux7. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, what do you guys do? At Toyota Research Institute, we do autonomous driving research. And at Flux7, we're a consulting firm that helps companies achieve long-term agility and innovation through uh, DevOps and pipelines and automation workflows. Wonderful. So today we're going to talk about machine learning infrastructure implementation for autonomous driving. It's a very interesting topic. I'm sure a lot of our viewers are interested to hear here. Absolutely. Um, so I do see a bunch of services, AWS services, and I believe that everything runs in AWS. Um, let's walk through a use case, right? So I know you're collecting data from cars. Arthur, walk us through this use case. Sure. Where does it start? Absolutely. So it starts off at the car, which is going to be um, driving either on the road or mm -hmm. on a test track. And it's going to upload, um, so it's going to collect data, and then that's going to get transferred over into S3. Okay. And um, what happened was when they contacted us to come in and help modify their their workflows to create a DevSecOps pipeline, right. um, before it would take them a week to provision this infrastructure. I see. So we created this Python script that's right. going to leverage service catalog, which is going to allow permissions for the data scientists to be able to provision the um, service catalog products, okay. which are actually going to deploy this entire infrastructure. Gotcha. So it's going to, uh, you want me to get it right into this? Well, let me ask you one question of clarification for our viewers, sure. right? So you have cars, you're driving, are these uploaded every day into S3 directly, or is it sort of a staging area that you would typically put it in? Arthur, before you move it to S3, how, how are you approaching the data transition from the car into S3? Uh, I can speak to that. So it, um, it's typically uh, after every drive, the data will mm -hmm. be uh, moved into S3. Is it directly or do you stage it on-prem or anywhere before you move uh, it to the S3? We, we stage it on-prem. Okay, and wh what's your approach to that? Is it a file system that you have that you use it to, to store it, or there's a there's a NAS uh, on each site. A NAS on each side. Okay, so you have essentially a, your car, you d drive, and then you load it into a NAS device, of which you put it in S3. Correct. Right. Okay, great. Now, and then you also mentioned that there's a simultaneous work stream here. Um, so walk us through an example. I'm a data scientist, right? And I want to take advantage of the platform to look at insights and look at the data for exploratory work. What happens here? Maybe Arthur, what does that represent? I see Python sure. icon there. So you have your data scientist. Mm -hmm. I'm not the greatest at stick figures, but <laughs> so he's going to trigger this Python script from his laptop. And there's constraints applied against service catalog that specify who's allowed to use those products. Okay. Uh, so it's going to check their credentials, make sure that they're allowed to, and then it's going to use the CloudFormation template, which will then provision the GPU cluster. From there, that GPU cluster is going to pull down all of the data from FSX, which okay. has been synced from S3. I see. When FSX is created, it pulls the data from S3. I see. So there's a, some sort of synchronization here. Yes. And then from a scientist standpoint, mm -hmm. I'm using a Python script, which then integrates with Service Catalog. What do I see? Maybe a question for you, David. From the Service Catalog, as a data scientist, what do I see? Sure. So uh, the script itself will, will output um, some information uh, as it runs, just some, some debug output. Okay. And then um, once it finishes, it will uh, it presents the user with uh, IPs of their, their GPU clusters that they can then use for training. OK. Do they have a number of different templates to choose from? Are you providing flexibility for scientists to choose you know, various different kinds of clusters? How does that work? Yeah, we have. We currently provide uh, two service catalog products. Okay. There's um, one for uh, FSX for Lustre, and then there's a slightly older one that uses uh, the parallel file system BGFS. Okay. Um, and you know, the nice thing about service catalog is that we can you know provide as many as many products as we need to support different uh, ML cluster use cases. I see. That makes perfectly sense. So for our viewers to understand, right? BGFS is also a parallel file system. 
Now, and I do see FSX here, FSX for Luster, I suspect that is, right? Yes. Which is another parallel file system. Now, why those two options? What would make a data scientist choose BGFS over FSX for Luster? David, maybe you can speak sure. to that. So uh, at the moment, uh, BGFS is mostly, uh, mostly a legacy offering, uh, mm -hmm. just in case somebody uh, decides that they need it. Um, we, we decided to go with uh, FSX for Luster um, shortly after it came out because it uh, it provided a bit more a bit more stability and of course being integrated with you know other AWS yeah. services makes it easier to use and deploy. Um, we we had a, a few issues with uh, stability with BGFS, particularly around um, buddy mirroring. Okay. Where you have you know two nodes that are essentially mirrors of each other for redundancy, um, but we we found that you know there was some uh, difficulty when nodes would go offline. Yeah. Which makes perfectly sense. Now, just the GPU cluster in itself, is a specific GPU cluster type that you chose here, David, for the data scientist? What do you offer here? From So uh, from th we provide uh, the ability to run all of these on uh, either P3 or P3DN instance types. Uh -huh. And um, you know the, the ML engineer can specify specifically how many they want when okay. they run the script. Oh, wonderful. So essentially, this is where you have your compute in the P3, and then FSx is essentially where the data is running. Um, and talk to us about the models, right? So I'm a data scientist. I've chosen my specific environment. Where do I start? What frameworks, deep learning, machine learning frameworks would I use? Can you speak to that, David? Sure. So we've, uh, we've standardized on uh, PyTorch at okay. TRI. Um, and you know, uh, uh, one of the one of the common use cases is you mm -hmm. know to, to train and improve a model that will then be used to um, you know improve the autonomous driving capabilities of the vehicles. Um, so an ML engineer will launch a cluster. Okay. They will you know they will train their model with PyTorch. They will refine it and make improvements. Uh, eventually, you know, getting to the the ML model output. Okay. So essentially, they use PyTorch. This is the model you're referring to. Is this model something that can be repeatably used or? Does the scientists have to recreate every, everything from scratch every time they provision this environment? Uh, so I think it, it depends on, on what they, they want to do. So if they find a model mm -hmm. that they, they think can be improved, they'll, they'll tweak parameters and they'll, they'll continue training it. Okay. And then once it gets to a, a point that they like, either for use in the car or for use in um, you know, publications, like for peer research, yeah. um, they will get artifacts from that and then that will, that will complete their training. Gotcha. So if, as a data scientist, you're constantly looking to incorporate improvements. And if they have to make modifications, how does that flow into this work stream? Can you walk us through some example, David, where, for example, if I need to update anything or make changes to my service catalog, what happens? So if you're, if you're, work, if you're continuing to work on the same model, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll continue to use uh, the same cluster Either for you know several days or, or maybe a handful of weeks, uh, the, the the whole the goal for uh, all of this uh, infrastructure was to make it uh, pretty ephemeral. Uh, so you know the clusters aren't supposed to hang around for too long. Yeah. You'll you'll do your training, you'll make your improvements, and once you get artifacts that that you like that you think work, uh, you can terminate the cluster and. If you need to train again, you can launch a new one. Okay, and you know just on the topic of machine learning. Um, would the GPU instance here, the, the essentially the size of it, does that give different scientists to run different workloads with different compute requirements simultaneously? Is it fixed number of resources you you have for their disposal? How does that work? Right now, uh, when uh, an ML engineer launches the cluster, mm -hmm. they get to uh, decide the number of P3 nodes that they okay. would like, um, and four to eight is is fairly common. Um, it, it's fixed right now. They, they do exist in an auto-scaling group in case some of them um, terminate for some reason. Um, it'll bring them back up. Um, we, we hope to get to a place in the future where it will uh, scale to the workload that uh, somebody has. Wonderful. This is truly exciting uh, architecture, really taking advantage of you know the managed file, parallel file system, FSx for Luster, enabling scientists essentially to use the service catalog to automate the process of provisioning and then leveraging you know deep learning frameworks like PyTorch to recreate and improve models and then feed that back to the autonomous driving experience. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing Thank you. this. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for watching. This is my architecture.